Many years ago, in a land far, far away. There was a band in need of a drummer. The name of the band is unimportant. The name of the drummer was a fellow by the name of Tim Alexander. Now this band stood in a room in the confines of a warehouse in Emeryville. And they looked at these drummers that came in one by one by one. It's Primus Tracks with Josh and Frankie. You want to tell a story? And some of them were good. Some of them were incredibly good. Some of them sucked ass. But Tim Alexander came in, and he had his bandana on, and he set up his funky little Ludwig drum kit that looked like it was made out of a kitchen table. And we said, what can you play? He said, well, I can play Rush. So we played some Rush. And we played some more Rush. We played a shitload of Rush. We said, God damn, you can play some Rush. But can you play some Primus? He says, well, I was listening to that tape, and I could play that one song. And I said, you mean this one? Hello, Primates, Primus fans, old, new, large, medium, small. You found Primus Tracks. Congratulations. At Primus Tracks on Instagram and Twitter. I'm Josh. I'm pointing to my right, a little back behind me to my right, and because that's Frankie. Hi, Frankie. Hi, Josh. It's nice to see you, by the way, Frankie, because we have a special guest today. I've known this guy, sort of, for about 20 years, and he is a wonderful musician and a sound engineer, and you guessed it, a huge Primus fan. And he's going to talk us through today's track, which is track nine from Frizzle Fry, Pudding Time. Uh, So because it's Pudding Time, I brought you all bibs. But uh, I would like to introduce to you Anthony Garcia. Hello, Anthony. Ahoy. Thanks for having me. Ahoy to you, too. Uh, Here's your bib. Thank you. Absolutely. Frankie, here's yours, too. I got you the, because you're taller than me, I got you the extra large. (laughs) Thank you. I don't, it's not because I think you're a sloppy eater. (laughs) Once again, Anthony, welcome. And we were talking about pudding time. It's one of those primus anthems, uh, but it's also just emblematic of the lunacy that this band is capable of. I always kind of think of this one as like the first in the uh, Pudding Chronicles, you know, obviously before Puddentane. Yeah. Man, this one's a banger, especially when they play it live. You can't sit still. Like people just go nuts for this one. Absolutely. It is one of those that just gets people bouncing. Tell us a little bit about your your connection to Primus. Jeez, wow. So I'm in the Bay Area. Uh, I'm actually in Sebastopol in the whole Primus country. You know, I got into them back in 95 from the Winona era and just kind of kept following them. And then I learned that Les is actually lives nearby and it was very easy to see them. And so i uh, God, I think my second concert was the New Year's Eve show of 97. And my mom was so nice to drive me out there and and sit through it. And, you know, it was a great time. And I just grew up with them. Wow. And uh, hold on, your mom went to the show with you? She didn't wait? Yeah, she, nope. She went in with me and, and took me there. And, you know, we had a great time. And awesome. Actually, interesting, interestingly enough, uh, she got me some nachos, which is very reminiscent <laughs> of Jerry at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, quite the coincidence and yeah it was just really cool and and continuing to see them and you know following them and yeah and they're still going and it's great uh props to your mom by the way my dad i know have dropped me off and been like i'm gonna be here at 10 30 if you're not out here <laughs> <laughs> That's Aww. excellent so you kind of grew up with the band but you're also a musician yes so I started as a guitarist and w- devoted a lot of my life to that. And uh, through just means and kind of how the river flows, I found myself into drumming. And I found myself kind of recording, writing songs. And I found myself 
just dabbling more in the recording aspect, the editing aspect. From there, I thought, well, what am I going to do with this? And so I decided to pursue recording as a as a career and found a college, uh, Expression College for Digital Arts in Emeryville, California, which is right next to Berkeley. Yeah, you didn't have to go very far. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and so I went there and was able to get a degree uh, doing what I geek out doing all the time. And actually, what was really cool is when I was going there, Jay Lane and Skerrick came in to do like a, a clinic. Whoa. So that was really neat to to be able to see them there. Yeah, it was, it was just a really cool connection to be able to do that and to to keep going. And then uh, from there, um, I just ended up working in public radio and have been doing that since. I, w- I kind of want to go back to what you said about being in the uh, Sebastopol area and just, yeah. you know, it's kind of easy to see uh, Primus people, Primus shows, Primus things. Mm-hmm. Would... Frankie's head explode if he just walked around town for a day? <laughs> like, would he just <laughs> be able to recognize all the references and just like lose his mind? Uh, yeah, they're not all super condensed as, as you know one might think, but yeah, definitely Sebastopol, Sonoma County area has a lot of stuff. Like, Cotting Town's just like this shopping mall that you wouldn't look twice at. Yeah. It's got this like old 1950s like revolving sign. One side says Cotting, the other one says Town. <laughs> Dale Davis's tree farm used to uh, used to be a thing. Now it's um, the Grayton Fire Department tree farm. Uh, but yeah, the sign was out there of Santa Claus cutting down a tree, and so that has always been a thing. Fire um, Department would be really tough to work into lyrics, I think. So Dale Davis tree yeah. farm makes a little rolls a little bit. But. <laughs> yes, uh, Dee's Diner wouldn't even look twice at, but apparently it's a thing, and uh, they have like Les's written lyrics on there in a little framed picture frame with the album cover and everything. So that's a nice little homage. Nice. I just, I, I'm just going to say, I think I hear Frankie clicking away like booking tickets right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's excellent. And yeah. that, that's really cool for the, uh, I guess the primus tourist, if there is such a thing <laughs> that you could yes. kind of make your own tour. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I know a lot of people will come out for the new year shows and the, and the wine party show. So it's a great thing to like spend a whole weekend. And then, you know, when you're done with that, do wine tasting, go out to the beach, wow, uh, go for a nice woodsy hike. Oh, and I forgot to mention the top. Today's episode is brought to you by the Sebastopol Tourism Board. Ooh, <laughs> so, nice. Uh, you know, they kicked down, down um, nothing. And uh, I thought, yeah, we'll, we'll let them know. So <laughs> <laughs> book your flight today. <laughs> Well, we're here to talk Primus, so we might as well do that. So it's putting time. Let's dig in. We have 332 documented live performances. And as with most of our Frizzle Fry tracks, there are likely dozens more that are undocumented in the early 90s and definitely in the 80s. But as is, this is still a track that is top 15 as far as live performances go. For myself, and I definitely want to hear from you guys, there are, I have a couple times that I've witnessed it that are meaningful to me. So in Las Vegas 2010, it had been seven very long years since I'd seen this band. And I flew out to Las Vegas for that special midnight show that started after the Rush show the same night. By the time that the show was starting, I had been awake for about 48 hours. And I was starting <laughs> to get a little wobbly. The anticipation of the band coming out, seeing them for the first time in seven years, like I was ready to go. They took the stage, you know, the crowd's going nuts, but then Les starts thumping those bass lines, that bass line to pudding time, and we were off. And it was just a huge surge of adrenaline at the time. And I still think about that moment uh, when he digs into that and the crowd just goes off. And you, you mentioned that, Anthony. This is the one that just gets people hopping. And then just a month later, I saw them here in Southern Oregon, and pudding time was the encore closer. Those were the only two times I saw them in 2010, but it's bookended by this track. So for me, and, I, and we'll get into it uh, the track itself for the band too in 2010 for me as well, like putting time qualifies as the anthem for the reformation of 2010. Yes. And actually that was putting time was the first song I believe that they played together when they reunited with Jay Lane yep. in San Francisco, which was another really cool thing. And what's funny is that it, it's such a banger. People were just standing there staring in awe. They weren't, bopping they weren't moshing they were just staring and soaking it in which is also kind of odd it's almost like when the the tides you know repel when there's going to be a a big tsunami or something you're just like whoa and it just builds up and again off to the races from a drumming point of view 
I think it's a really important track in the Primus catalog because, as you know, when Tim Alexander met Lur and Liz for the first time, uh, they began playing Rush songs. And then Liz asked Tim if he knew any Primus tracks. And he told him, he told Liz that he knew Pudding Time. So it's basically the first song that the first original track that they played together. And then when Jay Lane auditioned for, for Primus, that was also the song that sealed the deal for Les. Uh, he mentions in the Electric Grapevine book that when he heard uh, Jay playing Pudding Time, he turned to look at Larry and he could see a smile on his face. And he knew that Jay was the one. Nice. Oh, that's the part in the book, yeah, where they're saying, uh, he said, like, Larry and I were grinning at each other like idiots. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they just felt that energy, right? They knew it was there, and this was going to be the direction they were going to take, I think. Brad Sands had expressed uh, some concern about the choice. Uh, he he didn't think Jay would be the right drummer for the band, but Les told him that they had experienced some really great chemistry when they played Pudding Time. And, and Les is on record many times saying that Jay Lane is his favorite drummer to play with. And I don't think that's changed. There's something very peculiar about uh, Les when he plays with Jay. They always have to do the awakening no matter what. And <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of strange for me that Les has never done the awakening with Tim, like ever. That's kind of strange, mm -hmm. isn't it? Anthony, maybe you can speak to this because as a musician, is it, and I don't know, is it, is it one of those things where if, if you're playing as a duo, let's say bass and drums with the awakening or any other thing, um, it, if you play it so well with one person, is it hard for you to want to play it with somebody else? I mean, everyone kind of has their own flavor. You know, when you're playing with someone, you could really vibe off of what they're doing. And, you know, someone will say that they have a, the pocket. Yeah, I mean, I could totally understand that kind of in the same way that like, you know, they don't really play Silly Putty that often, but it's kind of one of those songs that you also get really locked into a groove. You know, perhaps Les and Jay just have this thing where it's also kind of uh, nostalgic and, you know, it just represents their rapport and their their bond, their musical bond. Yeah. And we, we got it on uh, the 2019 New Year's Eve performance with Sausage. Anthony, were you at that show? No, no, I wasn't at that one, but man, that would have been amazing. I saw the video of it and yeah. geez. Yeah. Frankie was down in the front row and I was up in the loge uh, trying to throw stuff and hit Frankie and I kept missing. <laughs> 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 the last song of the sausage set was putting time into Tommy the Cat, which was just insane. And then they mm -hmm. threw in the awakening as well. And, you know, by then, like, uh, I didn't, I didn't have a brain anymore. It had been microwaved by the wonderful music that I was hearing, but, uh, it was, it was phenomenal. And it is so strange that, that it doesn't get as much play, but when Jay's around, there it is. So that is interesting. I think I was, I was so, uh, focused on less perhaps, or maybe I was so amazed at what was happening that I didn't actually notice until someone pointed that out at the billboard. And then I checked the video that Jay flipped uh, Todd Huth off because he didn't uh, he didn't realize that they had changed the track to Tommy the Cat. <laughs> <laughs> I I was not aware of that myself. Yeah, I I saw the video of that and I had to double back and look. I was like, wait, what? Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> the moment. Let's uh, let's dive into to putting time the track itself. I mean, we have Larry, Les, and Tim, the classic Primus lineup, this thundering tune. A few episodes ago, I told this story about showing Frizzle Fry to some guys who had been talking about Primus 2 for years or however long, and they were like, okay, let's hear this band. And there was at some point where one guy asked to turn it down. But <laughs> there, even after that, like putting time was too much for these John Mayer listening dudes. Um, and I think it, it might be, Frankie, you pointed to it. It might just be that just killer double bass drum that's going on. It could just be the, all that bass thumping, all these 16th notes that we're getting, but there's just so much going on. And I'm so glad you're here, Anthony. Maybe you can help us break it down and, and find that magic. Yeah, it's a very frantic song and it's got a lot of really cool percussive things with less doing um, like a muted uh, fret mutes and stuff like that. And, 
strumming at the same time. And then Lair is doing all these really cool like tricks, almost like, you know, Alec Lifeson, uh, Alex Lifeson would do in Rush, where he's like doing these tapping harmonics. He's picking behind the guitar nut. He's doing whammy bends and all this really cool stuff. And then as it's totally crushing, it then all drops out and goes into this really funky hi-hat driven groove that you can't sit still for. It's like, again, he kind of goes into this Larry Graham thing. It's got everything. Oh, that's a wonderful description. <laughs> I, think, I think it's one of the most aggressive Primus tracks out there. But it wasn't yeah. always that way because, as you know, it started out as a really slow number with Jay Lane, Todd Who, then Les. And you can actually hear the sausage version a toaster. It's in one of the 1994 recordings, and it's totally different to the frizzle fry pudding time. It's like really, really slow. Yeah, I haven't listened to that version in quite some time. I've got to go back to that. But it is, you're absolutely right. I, I, and I wonder what, what drove them to make it more aggressive. Now, a lot of these tracks that started with Todd and Jay got more aggressive as Larry and Tim made their way into the band. But uh, it's, I, I really think it's got the Tim Alexander stamp on it because Frantic is a great word for that, Anthony, but I think Tim just drives it that way. Yeah, that double kick is, you know, right off the bat. It's like also kind of like, you know, Metallica-ish. It's that thrash metal. And also, you know, with Lair's take on it, uh, you know, again, with the Bay Area thrash metal um, roots, it just takes off. And, you know, maybe at that time, that's what also drove it is when Lair came in, he was just like, okay, let's take this thing to the next level. and you know, really oomph it. Yeah. One thing I'm noticing, especially between the sausage demo, for example, and then Frizzle Fry is the Larry is really piling on the distortion and really piling on the, those chunkier riffs. And, and that guitar uh, is almost, but I'm not going to say it is because I love it so much. It's almost overwhelming. The <laughs> sound that one guitar gets in this, in this mix, in this tune, it's so heavy. And then, and like you said, then he's just throwing everything out there. And I, I love this, that scream when we're getting into the verses of him, uh, as you said, uh, picking the strings behind the nut, this, that distorted scream there is so, it's just one of these things that it just creates this aura and you're going, what am I listening to? And I've, (laughs) I've, I've had a lot of bands like that, obviously never one like Primus, but thing I, or the best comparison I can make is the first time I heard pick a track from Trout Mask Replica by Captain Beefheart. You, what, you just sit there and you go, what the fuck? (laughs) In a good way. Uh, It just most, well, not for most people, but I love it. So it was, it just takes me to another place. I'm going, how do these people think of this stuff? Do you, do you remember the performance from Columbus, Ohio? Uh, hallucinogenetics tour that one not on my not on my list to talk about it's pretty cool because uh yeah you mentioned the the screaming part of the song like just before the before the end uh it's always cool to hear Les uh yell that part but on this particular show uh he made gorilla sounds <laughs> nice. talk about when he does Humpty, Dumpty? <laughs> Uh, no, uh, before, like, during the the, la- the last time that he says, it's put in time, children. But, like, yeah, instead of saying that, he made uh, some gorilla noises in this concert. <laughs> <laughs> Which, coincidentally, would be very hard to do in the gorilla mask. <laughs> right. Yes. It's, oh, that's so funny. I want to go find that one. So what's going on with, uh, we talked a little bit about the guitar, the, the stuff, the whammy dives and all this great stuff that, that Larry's doing. What's going on with the bass? Um, cause like, like I said, when we're getting into the verses, I think Les, he's doing these 16th notes. Is he strumming them? What's, I don't know what he's doing with those mutes. Yeah. So what he's doing is he's just kind of gently resting his, his left hand on over the frets, uh, or over the neck of the guitar, just so the strings don't ring out. And then he's just strumming and creating this, uh, kind of percussive, thing that would follow the hi-hat almost uh because also the hi-hats are doing like these 16th note things and so they're just really locked in and it's it's very like a primal groove and it's continues to go and uh, it's also one like those foundations of funk like kind of like tower of power would do and but with the bass like he's kind of just doing a finger thing he's not really fully strumming but one of the things with tower of power is that 
the bass is constantly moving. It constantly add like a 16th note thing and then we'll come in, but it's the notes are muted when they're not being played. That's kind of one of a, a trademark tone that could have been an influence for that song. But again, yeah, it's to be a fly in, on the wall for the jam session that that led to that song would have been pretty cool. You know, they're looking at each other and just being like, ooh, that works. We have this this metal sounding song almost. And then we just have that, this this groove here with 16th notes. And then the lyrics come in and who the hell knows what's going on with those. It, just to combine the, I, I don't know, these goofball lyrics with this such an aggressive tune. It's so irreverent. It just fits. During that spoken chorus of its pudding time, the 16th notes drop out and we get that percussive, those, that triplet kind of thing. That, and we've talked about this before. This is, these are three guys taking up that much space and doing all these different things. Les is such a percussive player, as you've stated, and we, we've seen before. It, does this song have a melody? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a traditional song structure by any means and that sort of thing. So what, from a musical standpoint, taking in that whole picture of that, that first riff, the first verse, the spoken chorus with Larry doing what he does and, and Les banging out those, those notes, what do you make of it? Yeah, it's not a very melodic song. It's it's more percussive and it's but I mean during those parts, uh there are these little accents that that Lair's doing, you know, over the verse that kind of it's very spacious. It's not overly busy, but it does give you, you know, some tonal aspect to it. But mainly it's it's uh, a vocal song. It it seems like if you if you're searching for melody, it's some kind of, you know, tonal tonal part oh it's in, are you saying it's in the vocals is that what you're saying yeah it seems like the the whole the strings and the drums are more of a percussive thing so it's all like drums and then you have the lyrics and the vocals actually being like the melodic part of the song fair enough speaking about the june 2010 rehearsal uh i mean i, I really like it i think it's got a really cool uh little set list but I, I recall reading uh, some criticism about that EP at some point uh, at the old Bullboard. And the particular comment that I recall is that the person said that it sounded too clinical, like too, too polished and too perfect. And I think it's not because of Jay's drumming or, or Larry. I think it's because of the pachyderm bass. Would you agree with that? Hmm. Well, I also know that now uh, Les is, I mean, he's always might have has thrown on a lot of compression onto his bass, which is essentially taking the loud parts and making them, bringing them down, turning down the volume when they get to a certain part. And that helps kind of create a more consistent tone, especially with the Pachyderm bass. It's very punchy and that's what compression can really do for you. And so that ends up being like almost like a signature pachyderm bass sound is very punchy, very quick and very clear. Like you can hear everything that he's doing and all these like intricate little taps and, and everything. So it can kind of make it a little bit more too polished and too, you can hear everything that's, that's there. Oh, okay. Yeah, that stands. I, and I, I think I appreciate that because there are things that, we don't catch uh, casually listening, say. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I miss a lot because there's so much going on. So to be able to hear more clearly what they're actually doing can give me that greater appreciation. You know, because I feel like I'm missing notes every once in a while, like lots of notes every once in a while. <laughs> they're doing things and I'm going, this sounds great, but it, it seems so simple, but it's never that simple. Right. And it's, and that, especially in, in Frizzle Fry, like this is, you know, it's in the age when, recordings are very clean they're very polished and people spend a lot of time doing overdubs and and things like that and perf making things perfect sounding but at the same time it's a very raw record like there are a lot of like little timing things that are there there's really cool like little i don't know twangs and things like that especially in pudding time uh there's like this one like really quick whammy bar thing that uh less does i think in like the second uh verse or something or maybe it's the third verse it's like Bow! and it's just it's really cool that he just throws that in there and you wouldn't really notice it i mean i didn't the, the first god few years i think i never really th thought 
second glance of it, but then it kind of became my favorite part of the song where it's like, oh, it's coming up. There it is. It's really <laughs> How about that breakdown or that bridge that leads into our breakdown? Um, wow. And I, that's the breakdown because um, you have to be breaking down to be screaming the Humpty Dumpty nursery rhyme. What's going on in that bridge before the breakdown? Before the breakdown. So it's the, the Humpty Dumpty part or just before that? Yeah, just before that with the do 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 that part right there. Are, are oh, they yeah. playing the same? Are Le, uh, Larry and Les playing the same notes essentially, of following each other? Yes. Um, and what's what's kind of cool about that is you know Les is doing like the if you see like a traditional power chord, it's you have an octave, which is you know your, the base of the octave is you know would be like index finger, and the octave would be you know either your ring or your pinky, depending on how you hold the note on a guitar. And then there's a major fifth in there, which you know, you could do a bar chord um, or a power chord. That's a, a major fifth. And that's kind of what the guitarists would do. But in, instead, what they're kind of doing is less likes to do the like the bar part of it. So it's, you know, just the lower two notes or the, the higher two notes, I should say. So it's like the fifth and the octave. So he's just able to just like clamp with one finger these two notes that are like on the same fret, but of two different strings. And Lara is kind of doing that also. The thing is like, he's not using the root note, which typically a guitarist would do. So he's kind of mimicking less, which you would think like less is kind of mimicking, mimicking Lara on that one. But no, it's actually Lara's playing more like what's being played on the bass, which is pretty cool. And it sounds very much in unison. Yeah, and and just that little part uh, to me, that part, them playing that in unison, and of course they did it in a studio, and you do your takes and all that. But when they do it live, they are so locked in uh, to be able to be playing that part at the same time. And that's just so impressive to me that they are that locked in to be able to do that. That's my favorite yeah. part of the song. Actually, I absolutely love the breakdown. You know, there are some soundboard recordings from Tour de Fromage and Hallucinogenetics where. You can actually hear Tim doing uh, something different each night, which I, I think is absolutely amazing. And, you know, the double kick drum in that breakdown is absolutely insane. I think it, it makes the song sound so huge and compelling. It's like you've reached the, the pit of madness or something because you're... <laughs> <laughs> and they lead us into it after that, after that bridge... Uh, and there's that little syncopated moment in the bridge too, da -na -na -na, and with those hits in there, and then they bring us back up, and and that's when the distortion. I think Les put some distortion on his bass, and it's just like all bets are off. I I am in the mouth of madness now. It's a really good buildup. It's like from a songwriting perspective, they have all like these different tiers that they go to, and you would think that that part, like the part before that, was like the plateau, but no, they take it to another gear that you didn't know the car had. Oh, good point. Yeah. They're like upping the ante all of a sudden. You're like, can this get any crazier? And, yeah. uh, and I, I think it's also important to point out that in the early nineties, uh, they would uh, introduce thieves into pudding time very frequently. And it made the song mm -hmm. even more aggressive than it already is. Probably the, one of the only primus tunes you can do that with to bring in something from, I don't know, ministry, you know, <laughs> and marry it to a Primus song. Absolutely. It's, that's pretty incredible. And I was going back through some set lists and go and looking for live footage of that. It just works really well. It does. I mean, to me, like it, it kind of derails the momentum if you are anticipating the big breakdown, but uh, it is really cool to drop that in there. And we particularly saw that on the, I believe when they were on the roll of the bones tour, as well as headlining in 92 and then Lala yeah. Blue 3 it was really common but you you can you can actually hear that uh carry on during the punch bowl tour and how do you figure that out you know i want to cover thieves i'm going to put it right here <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the big mystery to me I'm like why don't you just do it on its own or why don't you do it uh, during groundhog's day which obviously doesn't make any damn sense but like wh why does it make sense in pudding time i wonder 
And, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't have anything against ministry, but after, you know, I, I basically learned about that song because of Primus and I thought, wow, what a, what a cool song. I'm, I'm going to check it out. And honestly, I think it kind of overstays it, its welcome after a while. Uh, I think that <laughs> just, just a few seconds that the Primus plays are like quite compelling. Uh, yeah. The full song doesn't do a lot for me, to be honest, but it's pretty <laughs> cool to hear it in putting time. Not to go too far down the ministry road, but that song, a really good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine, made a bunch of rock, rock and metal uh, mixtapes for me in seventh grade. Because at that point, mm, I think the only CD I owned was the Aladdin soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check this shit out, and he's giving me. <laughs> And Primus was on there too, some some cuts from Pork Soda, and that like that's what got me hooked on Primus. But Thieves was on there too, and I thought that was such a cool tune. And then years in in the coming years, as I think you guys might remember, the old Bootleg Barn, Primus actually had bootlegs on their own website. Yeah. Coolest yeah. thing, out, one or one or two of those had "Putting Time with Thieves" in it, and I was like, I know that song. So it was <laughs> it was such a, a collision of worlds for me at that time. I think you you pointed out something really interesting, like how does Les figure out that. A particular song goes well with another one live and i think it's even more interesting when he does that with his own songs uh for example did you know that during the the brown tour he would slip uh, a little bit of arnie into southbound pachyderm Ooh. oh no that's kind of one of those uh white whales of a tune yeah, yeah. that's one i would love to get live not to go f- too far with that but oh man i would love to get that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, there's and that those two like to think about those two riffs, they have definitely elements in common. You know, with this putting time thieves thing, I think there there's kind of this natural stopping point. The tempo's almost the same and you get to riff really fast, I guess. You know, if if this is one of your more aggressive songs, then you get to do that speed picking that's in that little uh thieves riff. So I guess it makes sense. But Anthony, I, I got to defer to you. You're the guy with the most musical knowledge in the room. Well, like I, maybe they were just like driving to one of the next towns and, you know, you know how like you'll be in your car or something like that and you're humming a tune or you're thinking of a song and then it like meshes into another song because, you know, maybe they have a very similar like melody or something for, for three notes. Like every once in a while that'll happen with something. Yeah. It, it's just phenomenal. And then maybe they were doing that or perhaps they were doing a festival and ministry was up next or something and they uh wanted to play an homage and they knew that putting time would be the heaviest in the set or or something yeah who knows i mean it's kind of one of those um like almost like a well i wouldn't say synesthesia but like you know it's the blending of of two different things that you wouldn't necessarily maybe think of right off yeah. the bat the one that comes to mind for me and my wife points it out every single time <laughs> When I put on the expanse, she sort of likes it, sort of watches. And there's this just one little part in the in the in the title sequence, and I'm not gonna sing it, but there's this just this sequence of notes with a female voice, not even words, right? Just singing notes. And she's like, Oh, they totally lifted that from this one part in Outlander when blah 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 blah. I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> but she's like, No, but it's exactly like it. I believe you, but okay. <laughs> Those three, like you said, three little notes. You know, it's like, ee, 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 like that's it. <laughs> and I said I wasn't going to do that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sample that into a tune later. I don't. I don't know about. I don't know about you guys, but I think that the opening verse is a total uh, tongue twister. I've never been able to sing that opening verse. Yes, that's. I do want to talk about the lyrics and the vocal delivery because it's so different and so interesting. And I'm not going to attempt it right now. But the well, I said I wasn't going to do the other. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's 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 speed speed speaking, speed narrating, and it's going. He's so fast at it, and it's one of those things. I don't think I can duplicate it either without a ton of practice. Um, but he's isn't he? I think he's going right in with his sixteenth notes that are going on the drums and the bass. I think he's just going right with it. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. So that delivery. Yeah, like, pick a dick up out of dick up a dick you know. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. Um, I love that spoken chorus. It's pudding time. <laughs> it's pudding time. You know, like, <laughs> you know that, that traditional chorus usually has more than three words, but it's so funny just to have, it's pudding time. And it's becoming, in live performances, it's becoming more creepy now than aggressive when it's when he says it's pudding time children. Uh, <laughs> and or he, I guess, uses gorilla noises. I gotta listen. To him. <laughs> <laughs> this is like our third. 
This is the third track on Frizzle Fry where he brings in something from another pop culture product or the public domain. In our in to divide the laws of tradition, we have I'm the uh, I'm just a Bill. He he sings a little part of that and can't reprint the lyrics because he'll get sued. And then in the <laughs> middle of uh, Too Many Puppies, after the breakdown in Too Many Puppies, he does the peanut butter. I forget the words to that one. The peanut that gets crushed on the railroad track, that one. And then we have Humpty Dumpty, probably the most well-known nursery rhyme of all time. But he's screaming it over this really aggressive <laughs> riff. And it's the weirdest thing on earth. And I love it so much. You know, it's another thing that he probably just lifted from his childhood. Um, and because it's public domain, they get to put the lyrics in the book. Like, I used the word lunacy earlier. It's the heaviest part of the album. <laughs> this dude's singing about Humpty Dumpty. What mad genius does that? And the demo is even, is even crazier. You know, the demo on the sausage tape, because he actually yells the entire rhyme. He's like shrieking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> the adrenaline i i think that's it like he's just going for it on on that demo and and probably in a lot of these live performances in the 80s and 90s uh i do kind of want to get into the lyrics a little bit when we go back and look at those lyrics and just the title it's putting time first things first i'm we don't have to put on tinfoil hats this week frankie <laughs> i was i was just i was just <laughs> going to ask you that <laughs> I, we know les claypool is a huge pink floyd fan so by the time he's written this song he has listened to the wall what 500 times like, there's mm-hmm. got to be a relationship there. Because in that song, you know, how can you have any bread if you don't eat your meat? Oh. Uh, you have to eat your meat. And then because they're English, have you ever had English meat? Ew. So, like, it's like, <laughs> that's, that's work. It's like work to eat it. So, like, meat is the work and pudding's the fun, right? And the wall is this huge anti-conformity message anyway. And the wall that What's-His-Face built up around him throughout his life um, whichever Pink Floyd guy wrote it. <laughs> I'm probably getting yelled at by the audience right now because I don't remember which guy did it. Uh, in the wall, the film, like the kids in the school, they're ground into meat and then reassembled in the image of the education system. They're all the same. They're clones, whatever. So, but pudding is like seen as this reward, albeit it's like this false promise to me because like you get your pudding after you eat your meat, but you're actually going to get ground into meat you know, pudding is kind of like the self-indulgence, right? It's our own expression. But in this song, I don't know, like this, this idea that um, it must have had some influence over, over Les Claypool. I, I would think that he's extending the pudding thing, that self-indulgent part, the reward part. Tune to me, as far as the lyrics go, really seems to get into the idea of not so much like critiquing capitalism, but just the idea of consumerism, the consumer culture and buying happiness almost. And then he mentions money several times in a row. So there's more Pink Floyd for you there. Oh my gosh. Yes. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if he said to pay them royalties for this tune. Okay. <laughs> Form so much. But, um, you know, and I don't know if you guys did a, a, as deep a dive on the lyrics. Cause I, that's usually where I really like to go with these tunes, but um, I really think there's that influence on there. But, you know, a lot of people listening to this would just think, well, I don't know what he's saying. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make much sense. But if you stop and read them, they do kind of make sense. But this is one of the first tracks from this album where the, the lyrics don't necessarily tell a story, but they just kind of hang around this theme. Yeah, I mean, based on the lyrics, I mean, it could just be like, it's almost like an angry song. It's a venting song um, of kind of, of this aspect of, again, like buying materialism, purchasing things uh, to kind of distract yourself from you know the the pains of life like the the san francisco uh san francisco the striped bass are dying but you're going to get that brand new bike so you're kind of getting again something from it to distract you from this pain and then perhaps maybe the humpty dumpty thing is like the the, the consequences of the overindulgence Ooh, i like it <laughs> put your hat on <laughs> yes i i'm buying that hook line and sinker Sorry for the stripers, but that's what. Ooh, yes. <laughs> no, I think I think you're onto something there. Yeah. Um, or it was, you know, I just maybe he thought this is this. I'm going to this is our heaviest moment on this album. I am going to scream a nursery rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> there are push pins and yarn all over the wall, and the map is just <laughs> laid out. You're you're just uh, covered in sweat, right? And uh, <laughs> enough for four days. 
gosh, what a strange, you know, to, to, to start to pull it apart and talk about it with you guys. This is such a strange track. Yeah. And I never really thought of it this way before. And, you know, what, something really curious about this track is that it's basically been the same, but there are a lot of differences at the same time. So as I mentioned, we have the sausage version, which is really slow. And then we have the Primus version from Frizzle Fry. And when it's played with Tim Alexander, it's like really aggressive, really compelling. But then we also have Putting Time as performed with Jay Lane. And it's, it's a funky track. You know, it's a lot less aggressive. It's more focused on, on groove. And then we also have Putting Time with the Carl Thompson bass, which is like really almost metal, as you said. But we also have Putting Time with the Pachyderm, which is like so polished, you can actually hear every little detail Les is doing. And let's not forget, we also have Putting Time with Brain, which is like perhaps the most aggressive version of Putting Time. Yeah, actually, the first time I saw them play Putting Time was OzFest 99. That was the opening song. They had, you know, they had to put in a little bit more to get the metal crowd going. But uh, that was a great song to start off with. And, you know, again, at that time, I don't think Brain was using a double kick. I think he's he brought that in maybe late 99 or early 2000s. But he was really just kind of going to town on that on with one foot. But yeah, he was able to make it really, really intense as well. But I think he was going for it with one kick. I mean, he's got the speed and the power to do it. He's a, he's able to do these really cool single uh, single foot tricks and things like that. And he's got the stamina too. Yeah, I think so. He can definitely pull it I off. I think we haven't praised Brain enough on this podcast. He's an absolute monster drummer. Yeah, and he's a heavy hitter. In three years, when we get to the Brown album, <laughs> 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 don't know. Like, I'm just going to have to talk about his drumming because it is so interesting and so different. And that's the thing with this band that's gone through, not gone through, but experienced many different drummers is you get all these different feels. Frankie, you just had this huge list. I mean, and that changes things up and keeps things interesting, I think, for everybody, band included. And I'm I actually am curious about that, Anthony, because you've played and gigged. Uh, down there in the Bay Area, what's that feel like uh, when a new drummer comes in or a new bass player or a new guitar player or a new kazoo player? (laughs) Just jamming with someone? Well, sure, jamming with somebody or like, this guy's our new bass player, let's go. It could be kind of weird seeing that sometimes. It's, you know, like sometimes you might not be able to get it at first. It's kind of like watching a movie or, or, you know, or like listening to an album and not quite getting it at the first time, but then it really kind of wears and grows on you. But I can I can speak with like, you know, with jamming with someone, it's almost like going on a date because you don't know how it's really going to go until you both meet up and you see if there's chemistry, which, you know, there could be very good musical chemistry between people and they just read off of each other and they know where they're going to go. They can anticipate kind of where the song will lead to and you just have these really big, immense jam sessions. Uh, and then, you know, um, bands that get different members or maybe even you know for different album cycles like king crimson they they change out their lineup quite a bit you know that's kind of they add their own different feel and their vibe and it's hopefully you know they they don't try to replicate previous members they just kind of do their own thing and it fits really well which kind of is what brain did he really did just kind of present what he was doing he didn't go out and get like a mountain of drums he just had his you know his really big bonham kit uh with big shells and everything which is also like the very first one was acrylic which is definitely like a throw throwback to bonham you know he just he was himself he didn't try to get a big double kick drum set that would take half a day to get behind because you know you have to drive all the way around it to get to the end yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> to bring it back to pudding time i'm curious too from your uh sound engineering background and experience what about this track uh sonically on the frizzle fry record now one thing i remember them saying they went with a very dry recording intentionally because of all the big reverb sound that was going on uh in pop music at the time especially the you know the butt rock i i assume they intentionally did that But even without that, that even with the dry sound, it just sledges you over the head when it wants to. So how does that work uh, from a sonic standpoint? Yes. So, I mean, you can actually, we can compare it with with Sailing the Seas of Cheese, which has a fair amount of reverb to it. And it's in a 
fairly big room from what it sounds like, whereas different fur studios, which is where Frizzle Fry was recorded, had kind of a relatively smaller live room. And I mean, I don't know what how they actually arranged everything in the room when they were tracking, but there's like, from what I recall, there's like this little stage in the corner of the of the room. And so usually, you know, you'll you'll put drums in the corner so then you can put microphones as far away from it so you can get that really nice room tone, which gives kind of a a distance to drums when you're recording it. But what's also cool is that it, things don't get muddied up because you do kind of risk that with ambience or ambiance, ambience. And uh, that's what they did with this one. They just kept it really simple, really direct. Again, like the bass is going through a, just his rack his like ADA rack mount guitar preamp into the solid, solid state logic console, which from what I've read was the first one in the Bay area that was installed in a studio uh, at different fur. And it's a very iconic mixing console. It's a lot of places still have them and they're, they won't change them out cause they sound really good. Yeah. It's, that that's just how they did it. And I mean, in contrast too of like what other people are doing, I mean, think of, I could feel it in the air tonight by Phil Collins, just like that huge thing. And a lot of pl- people were doing gated reverbs and there was the, uh, the, a lot of go-go music that was happening, which brain was into, which, you know, does have a, a fair amount of, can have like a fair amount of reverb into it. I'm, I'm curious about what you said about the drums to give them, did you say like, give them a far away quality? To, if you, if you put the mics, uh, you know, not like right under the drum, but a little bit further away, what can that do for you? Yeah. So if you put your mics really close to an instrument, you'll get a really direct sound. It sounds like you're right next to yeah. it. Usually, you know, if you're, if you're listening to an instrument you're not like you don't have your ear right next to it you're (laughs) generally further back and also with with drums you have like the resonance of the shells and all these uh, and the you know if you're using two heads you'll get more of the the bottom head on it too but you'll hear more of the shell and more of the whole room interacting and that's why recording studios you know have their thing and why a lot of people can't really get that sound at home you know, people say like, oh, well, I'm trying to record this, but I can't make it sound that good. It's like primarily like it's the acoustics of the room that make it that makes it so special and how isolated it can be and how quiet it can be. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have a gigantic room to do it. Uh, it's just kind of the acoustic layout of the room will really help that. So you don't have a lot of weird echoes and you don't have these really bad spots where all the base is is hanging up and places to avoid but again that could be its own thing you know the brown album is is very just like oh wow from a recording standpoint a lot of people would be like wow they just didn't care they just threw all these mics up and distorted their preamps and it sounds like oh my god i i mean in and of itself that's its own great quality if that's what they're going for then there's nothing wrong with that again it's art but that was their take uh, on it. And I think they did a great job by avoiding what all the other bands were doing because that set them apart. That really made it not just another 80s record. It was just washed and reverb and had like have or a gated reverb, I should say, is when, you know, it hit the drum, kind of make this really big tone, but then it would cut out. And that's another thing that um, kind of is a Phil Collins thing. I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm thinking of you mentioned in the air tonight, so I'm thinking of that big drum with that yeah. sound on it. Yeah. You're right. This Frizzle Fry record, almost completely the opposite. It's just this straightforward uh piece of work. And it holds up. I mean, we're talking thirty years ago now, and this it sounds phenomenal. I mean, there's recordings from nineteen forty two that sound phenomenal, but this one, it could have been recorded yesterday. Reverb can kind of like, you know, hide a little bit of stuff, little imperfections because it it adds this washiness to it. It's kind of like putting a fuzziness, you know, like slight glow of everything. Oh, like a soft focus on a on somebody. Yes, a soft focus. It's kind of like putting that on. So you kind of like is a little bit of a makeup thing. But no, they're they're not afraid to just like whip off the clothes and just be naked and just have their tones just stand out and all the the playing right then and there. Although I should say, Spaghetti Western does have a fair amount of ambience and uh delays and and um reverb and things like that but that's more of like obviously like you know it suits the song it's to serve the song right yeah it wasn't there for um to cover up anything (laughs) right yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) i mean not that people do that to cover up but i mean you know it does kind of add this little 
washiness to it. Um, I think it's it's worth uh, mentioning the sausage demo because uh, Matt Weinegar recalls in the Electric Grapevine book that they just set up microphones on the floor. The band played the songs live, you know, without uh, any rehearsing. He just set up the microphones and they went into it. And I think it sounds absolutely amazing for a demo. Yeah, it's very clear. Like it, it would sound like almost like, you know, in, in Frizzle Fry where, you know, they, they saved up a bunch of money and they went into this really big studio. And it, I mean, it's just their chemistry together is fantastic. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast and you have not heard the sausage demo, what are you doing with your life? Please go, go listen to it. Because <laughs> you're gonna, on the you book, uh, Matt Weinegar recalls that all those versions floating around on YouTube uh, don't sound nearly as good as the actual demo that they cut that day. He says that nothing sounds as great as as a master. And then yeah. we have Tim Soya on the show, and he told us that that master is lost, and he's looked for it uh, along with Les Claypool for a long time. I, they've never been able to find it. So we reported the sausage demo master as lost, but plot has thickened. <laughs> we have a surprise for everyone, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Oh, good tease, mm. Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Sowing some seeds right now. That's excellent. There's one thing before we start to wrap this up. Uh, we usually talk about exemplary live versions. There is a full show on YouTube from uh, March 21st, 1992, San Jose State University. It's like a hometown show, essentially, right? It's San Jose. The crowd is wild. They know all the words. And it's, a, it's 1992. It's a VHS recording, but it looks and sounds really, really good. This is a special one because, of course, they play Pudding Time. It's 1992. They only have like, you know, 20 songs. They play Pudding Time. And Todd Huth guests on Pudding Time. So you've got a two guitar attack on that track uh, as they as they play it live. First of all, Todd has some really awesome hair going on that I want to ask him about someday. <laughs> but it's really cool to see two guitar players playing on that song and, and doing doing some different things with it because you have, you know, two guitar players that have played this track before in different ways. So it's fascinating to watch that. You know, I'm not old enough to have been gone to that show, but man, that was the era to have seen them is like 92 and all as well. I mean, you know, that could be very much debated, but man, I would have loved to have seen them back in that time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I wasn't old enough and I was very, very far away. So I wasn't getting a ride. I'd like to mention five particular performances that are truly epic. Wait, before you, before you do is, are any of them from the Seahawks exhibition hall? <laughs> you got me. Uh <laughs> 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 I'd like to start with the suck on this version because I think it's absolutely fantastic. The second one would be Honolulu 1993 Pork Soda Tour because it's a radio broadcast, so the quality is really great, and they, they throw thieves in during pudding time, and it's absolutely amazing. Uh, then I'd like to mention Detroit 2003 Tour de Fromage. Uh, it's the one that we mentioned where Les starts putting time, but then he goes into John the Fisherman, and then he goes back to putting time, and then he goes back to John the Fisherman, and he was probably driving Tim and Larry crazy. And the third one would be, no, sorry, the fourth one would be Norfolk 2003 uh, Tour de Fromage. It's a really great performance. I, I can't point out specifically why but i mean the breakdown and the general delivery of the track is amazing and of course i'm, I'm not going to stop until everybody has heard the seahawks auditorium uh, concert that's the the fifth one that i like to mention it's a stellar performance of putting time you know one thing i've been really wondering about is 
if it's been recorded uh, for another demo that maybe we're not aware of, like, because I know that they're at least on the interwebs and who knows, if, who knows if all this stuff is true, but it sounds like they've had other demos that they've done. So like, t- like too many puppies had been recorded as a demo from what I've overread. So maybe there's a demo out there that, you know, has yet to be revealed that could have, you know, too many puppies putting time and something else. Who knows? Um, as far, as far as we know, well, uh, we have the sausage demo, and we we knew that another demo existed called the Sucking Songs demo or the Primus Socks demo dating back to 1986, but we had actually never seen one until last year. Uh, we actually did a fundraising at the Bullboard, and we managed to buy it. Uh, that one has four tracks, but Putting Time isn't there, and yeah... Too Many Puppies uh, and Prelude to Fear, at least, were recorded in demo form uh, by Liz with a drum machine. Uh, the thing is that, as far as we know, uh, they, have, they have never circulated in any form. Um, mm. I'm not aware of Liz making any tapes of those particular demos because they are not mentioned in the book. Uh, the first physical uh, release that they mention is the 1986 uh, Primus Sox demo. So we don't know what he did with those demos that he recorded at the church. And he also recorded some demos in his apartment in 1991 uh, of tracks that would mm-hmm. some some ended up in Seas of Cheese, uh, some ended up um, on Hybel with the Devil, but those haven't those have never circulated either except for one track which uh actually josh was really kind to share with me uh it's a carolina rick demo but other than that nothing is floating around on the internet as far as i'm aware yeah there, who knows what's floating around i mean you know maybe less has lost track of it at this point but man there must be i mean he's got to lay his ideas down on something so maybe there's all sorts of stuff floating around there that's in some closet or storage yeah. space. <laughs> and I think at one of those <laughs> VIP uh, meet and greet things, somebody asked about demos or box sets or that sort of I thing. I did. I did. That was me. Uh, well, that was you. Is, it was, yeah. Was it you? Ooh. When you asked that, was that was that when he answered, uh, my kids can take care of that when I'm dead? Was that? that that's, that's right. That was the, the VIP. Um, I asked... <laughs> I asked Les nice. about all those unreleased demos and alternate takes. And, you know, I told him, like, when are we going to hear the precipitation demo with the Monty Python uh, samples? And he told me that he had completely forgotten that it even existed. And then I said, well, what about the Seas of Cheese uh, reels with alternate takes? And he said, he, he said that they didn't exist. And I pointed out that Cheney posted a picture of them um, on Claypool Cellars and he asked her where she had found them and she said they were in storage. So he, he had no idea about those either. It's a, it is a bank vault of genius. That's man. And I got to tell you, this is the time, you know, not to date the podcast, but it's quarantine time. Why wouldn't you (laughs) find all your old cool stuff? You should like release a giant, like the cheesiest box set and it's just like this giant hunk of cheddar that you just open up and it's like i don't know like a cd changer filled with all these different discs of unheard material that's the only (laughs) way you could package it there's no other way to do it you have to do it that way so i'm gonna say this putting time i think it's time that you lick your dish clean because (laughs) uh next time On this very podcast, we get to explore Frankie's favorite movie genre, Soviet (laughs) anime. No, I'm sorry. That's his second favorite. His first favorite is the Western. Thank you for listening. Anthony, man, thanks for joining us. This was so fun to talk to you. It was. Thanks so much for having me on. So (laughs) don't forget, folks, if you leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, we would love to read it on the air, even if you hurt my feelings. (laughs) Uh, We'll see you next time. Later days. Willie Peace. Time children.